we, we have a short amount of win uh, window of time to cover quite a lot of ground, as always, with these sessions. So I wanted to dive straight in with a, a big but difficult question. Mm. Your business secretary in a government that's been in charge for 13 years, why are we less prosperous? This is a great question, uh, and it's a very challenging one to answer. Uh, we are less prosperous for various reasons that are not unique to the United Kingdom. And one of the interesting things about being business and trade secretaries that I get to travel all around the world, uh, just last week I was in Japan, and the problems that we have here are the same as the ones they have in Japan, same as the ones they have in the US, France, India even. And this is uh, a fundamental challenge of our age. And if you think that the problem is about which specific government has been uh, in power, rather than what the status quo is for liberal democracies, mostly but not exclusively Western, then you're misdiagnosing the issue. We are uh, growing at a much slower rate than we ever have done before. And I think that that is because of two things. One, that the state itself is doing more than it ever used to do before. We have made demands on the state. We ask for more and more regulation. We ask, uh, we ask the government to intervene in things that it never used to intervene before. We ask people not to do the sorts of things that they might have done, perhaps even looking after their own security. We are an aging demographic, uh, not just in this country, but across, again, liberal democracies, which means that things like social care, which didn't cost that much before, if at all, are now huge costs. Those are burdens on the state. So do you think but, what is, but what is more interesting, the second thing, is actually our attitude. And there has been a fundamental sort of cultural shift in terms of attitude around risk and what I call safetyism. We, we fear being entrepreneurial now and people prefer safety. We talk about risk as if it's a bad thing rather than something that generates creativity, innovation, and reward. And we create a system around us, and by we, I mean everybody, not conservatives, not the UK, a system around us that's uh, built to try and protect people from experiencing anything that might be negative. And if you see the way that filters uh, culturally into workplaces, into businesses, into government itself, you will see one of the reasons why we're just simply not as prosperous as we used to be. So that's one area where government can actually tackle business more. Is that right? That when you see what sometimes is called woke capitalism or businesses that are kind of obsessing about things separate to their core commercial mission, mm -hmm. would you like to see government, perhaps including your own, pushing back more strongly against that? I think this needs to be done uh, across the board, not just specifically in business. So we have to be very careful about creating a solution that could be misused by someone else uh, in power. So I believe in limited government. And it, the government intervening, whacking every mole, kicking every barking dog, sets precedence for a different type of government to decide to intervene in business. Generally, there has been a consensus, even uh, amongst what I would call the center left, that businesses should be left to get on with focusing on their core purpose. They know what's best for them. But something weird is happening, and that is that in a low growth environment, businesses are now competing, not on who can make the most profit, but who can signal the most virtue and hope that that is a way of generating investment. And you see that manifest itself in things like uh, ESG that's not actually doing ESG or DEI, it's not actually doing DEI. And I assume everybody knows what those um, acronyms mean. But when I, when I look at, and I say this now, not just as business and trade secretary, but also as an equalities minister, when I look at what a lot of corporations are doing on diversity and inclusion, it's got nothing to do with diversity and inclusion. There is no analysis, there is no rigor. And when the rigor is provided, they shy away from it because it means they cannot signal what they're trying to signal. So a good example is looking at uh, racial disparity. Now, racial disparity has a lot of causes, myriad causes, but the zeitgeist is that racial disparities are due to racism. If you misdiagnose the cause, you can't solve it. So you end up having lots of diversity and inclusion policies that are all about tackling the racism when there's a whole slew of reasons that are causing the disparities which are left untouched. So they don't change they get worse, which means they keep providing more of the medicine that's not working, that's actually reducing trust, which you need in order to create a healthy work environment. 
And then that then feeds into the narrative that, of course, everything must be racist. Look how terrible it is. It's getting even worse. We're becoming more and more racist. Mm -hmm. And you end up in this sort of febrile uh, cycle that's actually not solving the problem and is giving people bad information. So would you actually like business to be colorblind in its application processes? I mean, that's a, become a kind of loaded phrase, but do you think that the color of people's skin should not even be considered? So I think there are two things that you need to do. We need to have a system where the color of your skin doesn't matter. However, we should also make sure that we are not complacent and we can actually check if people are being discriminated against because of the color of their skin or their nationality, their ethnicity or religion. If you don't look, then you don't know if, uh, if, if something wrong is, is happening. So what you're describing perhaps is the, French, uh, is the French way of doing things where everybody's French and no one looks at uh, skin color. They don't, they don't capture any of this data. I don't think that uh, when you look at the outcomes of French systems, I don't think that they're dealing enough with where there is genuine discrimination, which then creates a lot of resentment, which you're trying to solve. I actually think that, uh, you know, despite some of the stuff that you'd see uh, in the news, we do do a lot of this very well. But being colorblind is part of that. Doesn't mean being color stupid, but making sure that you're treating people on merit, meritocracy. You have to look at the values that you're, you're putting forward. So it's about meritocracy, not about race quotas or anything like that. Right. And if you focus on what the value is, you will get it right. So that, the whole concept of equity then, that has now become very popular, the Biden administration seems to be implementing it all over the place, which is almost kind of reverse fitting into quotas. Mm. You are a strong opponent of that. Yes, I am, because I think a lot of these things are coming out of uh, various branches of academia who don't actually have to deal with the consequences of their flawed ideology. I think that when you look... Thank you. When, you, when you look at the things that come out of the ivory towers, their uh, discussions on equity, again, no rigor. I remember having a debate with um, uh, a lady called Kimberly Crenshaw, who was the queen of intersectionality. I think she came up with the phrase. And she'd never met someone like me. She'd never met a black woman who had a different opinion and who came from Africa, so blacker than her and poorer than her and uh, you know, being effectively a first generation immigrant to this country. And she couldn't deal with it because every time she made her arguments, people either patronized her or were too scared to disagree because they didn't think they were allowed to, perhaps because of the color of, uh, color of their skin or whatever. But these are very, very problematic ideas. I'll give you another example. Decolonization is one of the things which has spread out from, uh, from academia all over the place. And I remember about two years ago, there was some woman who uh, shared some WhatsApps which I'd sent about uh, me saying that I don't care about decolonization. And everyone thought this is a horrific thing to say. How can you not care? Do you not care about all the things that, that happened? And the point I was trying to make is that we can't refight the battles of 100, 200 years ago. We have to deal with what is happening today. And if people are, are, are arguing about what happened during slavery or colonization or whatever, it means they're not solving today's problems. And you have to look at what the agenda behind these ideas is. People who are talking about decolonization are not really looking for equity. They are trying to unmake the world that we have and recreate it in their own image. So, So, so we, we need to not be naive about what they're trying to do. Because, and you can see a perfect example of what's been happening over the last few weeks where, uh, you know, with the, the situation in the Middle East, where suddenly those arguments, which seemed quite interesting, are suddenly being used to justify terrible things. We have to be very careful about what people are saying and doing and make sure that we keep our principles, we keep our institutions, we keep our values very strongly entrenched in enlightenment, enlightenment values, liberalism, freedom of association, uh, presumption of innocence uh, until proven guilty, making sure that, that your freedom of speech, these aren't just things that we, we mm. say randomly. These things matter because as soon as you start to curtail them, then you create a void for all sorts of nefarious ideas to, to fill. We've got to stop that. And how much do you think it's the job of government to try to fix those values when they've gone wrong. I mean, one kind of counterexample might be what Ron DeSantis is doing over in Florida, 
where he's really bringing it to certain businesses in a way that probably spooks a lot of people on the center right um, because they feel maybe he's overreaching. What's your view on that? Should government be more active against this kind of business? So I, I quite like Ron DeSantis. Um, I'm actually going to, I think, uh, unless something changes, I'll be seeing him week after next because I should be signing an MOU with, with Florida. And I've met him before. And I understand what it is that he is trying to do. There is a role for government in terms of shaping culture. Government needs to set out the vision for what society should be. And I think we've become a little bit shy about uh, doing that for several decades. We don't want to sound like we're trying to tell everybody how to live their lives. And so even when we see things that we don't like, we stay quiet. And I think that that's created uh, perhaps more inertia than, uh, than, than, than there should be. However, we must again be careful of overcorrecting. If you license government to step into every single situation, what happens when it is not a government of your choosing? We need to set the parameters for when government should go in and when it shouldn't, because you want to have a government that even if it's not your particular ideology or tribe, still behaves in a way that you think is acceptable. And I think that's where, that's the line that we're carefully treading at the moment. I don't think we always get it right, but that's what we're trying to do. There's one issue over here, which I think has changed in the past couple of years, which is connected to these kind of mm. other issues, which is the question of gender. And a lot of businesses have been really quite militant in making sure that their employees uh, sign up to a certain view mm. of connected to trans women and so on. And you've been quite vocal on this. Mm. Um, do you feel like the argument here in the UK has turned uh, and that somehow some of the more extreme ideas around trans ideology are now being defeated? Um, I do think they are, but I think we should take a step back and look at how we got here. How did, how did we get here? And this is where I think government does need to do a little bit more. And it's about uh, challenging activist groups that take over institutions that should be neutral. Uh, we started going down the wrong track uh, on uh, gender ideology because we allowed other, other people to start, to start telling government what to do. Again, ideas that came from uh, the leftist part of the academy, feeding into particular charities. Stonewall is the, is the best example of this. It's not the only one where it had uh, been captured. It's not the same Stonewall that, that we had 20, 30 years ago and started advising government saying, well, this is what you need to do in order to serve uh, a particular community. And then it overreached and started giving people legal advice or advice that was certainly different from what the Equality Act said. Government needs to be more confident in itself rather than ask other people to mark our homework and wanting to be on Stonewall's top 100 list. That's when things start to, start to go wrong. And I think that we were able to turn the tide once we stopped being informed by people who had uh, an agenda but were pretending to be neutral, pretending to be charities rather than activist organizations mm -hmm. and starting to do some of the work in-house ourselves. And I think that's the template that should be followed. Let me throw another one at you that really exemplifies this tension between where government should stop and, and businesses should be left alone or not. And that's the question of freedom of speech because mm -hmm. we now have these vast social media companies and online media outfits that are near monopolies perhaps uh, and they are so far are quite at liberty to censor certain political opinions. There's a lot of people who are worried about the Online Safety Act, mm -hmm. which is uh, an artifact of, of your government, that people worry is actually going to make it timid corporations are more likely to censor mm -hmm. in that kind of environment. How, how can you safeguard freedom of speech? And should you be really bringing it to those organizations that seem to not be that interested in it? Uh, so this is, this is another area where we are battling with uh, changing culture, change of mindset. I'm a believer in free speech, but I, as I wrote, I wrote in a paper uh, for a think tank that no longer exists called Freer about freedom of speech, and I called it freeish speech. That we've never had untrammeled free speech. The definition, uh, certainly the classical liberal definition of free speech was being able to say things without the government uh, you know, taking you down or out but you didn't have a right to go into uh, any other organization and say whatever you liked. I think the real challenge is uh, what you alluded to earlier about monopolies, that when you have organizations that become so big, they effectively become more powerful than government in terms of regulating what people say. We do need to take a look at that. And there are parts of the online safety bill that are actually written uh, to, deal with, uh, to deal with that. 
I think what has uh, made the Online Safety uh, Act as it is now more difficult was that it was written, started uh, a long time ago to deal with a very specific problem and then grew and grew and grew. I, I am a fan of smaller bills where it's tackling a specific issue and uh, without it being dragged into, without other issues being dragged into it. And I think having smaller bills that are very focused on uh, specific issues rather than a gigantic issue like online safety, which is just so huge, would all, mm. will minimize the risk of, of things going wrong. We're talking big picture about prosperity mm. in this session. So part of, we've, we've touched on areas where maybe the government needs to engage with business more, but give us a bit of a bigger picture vision, if you will, of how you think we can get back to higher prosperity. What do you think the drivers are? What should countries like the UK, the US, Australia be focusing on to, to thrive in this new world? Uh, so I've talked a bit about what I think is creating our productivity and prosperity challenge in terms of just general culture, risk attitude, and so on. But I think that there is, uh, and I look, I, I'm looking at this again from my portfolio in business and trade, I think that there needs to be an acknowledgement that the world we used to live in has changed. And there was, I, I, I remember as a child uh, living in Nigeria, everybody who worked in the oil com companies was an expat. Now that's not the case. It's very rare to find British workers working you know, in oil fields there. There's opportunities have changed. Other countries are catching up. This is one of the, uh, one of the reasons why I was a believer in leaving the EU because our economic settlement was almost uh, dependent on the assumption that other countries in the EU would always be poorer and would always be sending their poor here to do all the jobs that we didn't want to do. This is not sustainable. And as we are seeing, as they get richer, just the supply of labor becomes more difficult. It's not because we've left that the supply of labor has become so challenging. This was always a natural uh, conclusion as other countries became richer. So we need to understand that the world has changed. And that means thinking more broadly, not just about who's next to us, but who thinks like us, who is like us across the world, doing more with uh, like-minded allies. So that's why we joined the trade group uh, CPTPP, which is uh, countries like Canada, Mexico, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Australia and so on, countries who want to do business the way we want to do business, uh, areas where the, or, or regions where the global middle class will be coming from, making sure that we keep uh, up to date where we have comparative advantage, so not trying to subsidize industries that we can't support, uh, but ensuring that we still have the resilience on food security, on energy security. If we start off with those areas, I think we would, we would do well, and then make sure that we're continuing to trade with our neighbors. Free trade still generates prosperity, um, and we have to think very carefully about how we have a I mean, fair the, trade. The US system. doesn't seem that interested in free trade. They, they are, but they are worried, as every other country is, uh, about China. And uh, the government has repeatedly said that China creates, it, it just generates a huge economic challenge, the likes of which we haven't seen before. And the point I'm making about like-minded allies is that if you are all going to have free trade, everyone needs to play by the rules. If people are not playing by the rules, it's not free trade. And at the moment, what we're dealing with is uh, a rules-based system where the rules are consistently being broken by one country in particular. And everybody, be it India, be it the US, be it the UK, and some of the smaller countries, Japan, uh, not small, huge economy, but also feeling a lot of economic coercion from that one country, that is not free trade. And so when we get back to that rules-based international order, which we and the US and other countries set up, I think that things will be a lot better. Final question for you, uh, Kemi. We had a panel here just before you arrived, which in a way was quite troubling because everyone seemed to agree that we're in a new multipolar world, that the era of American hegemony is over, and that in many ways it's gonna be very scary and different. Do you agree with that? Do you think we're now in a multipolar world and do you think we're gonna be able to thrive in it? It's too soon to tell. It is too soon to tell. Um, you know, I know that people often misquote uh, Francis Fukuyama and the end of history, but I think we should wait and see. What we should be doing is everything we can to ensure that we're not in a multipolar world where we have more enemies than we do allies. That means 
talking to uh, countries who may not necessarily be like us, but trying to bring them along, not being preachy. I think sometimes we can be too preachy and uh, use very high-minded values without being realistic about what those countries need in order to develop their economies. And if we, if we just give up and we say it's all too difficult and it's too late, then, then we, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I am, I'm a cynical optimist. I don't think that things are as bad as, the, um, as, as others do. But I do think we are on the cusp. There is an inflection point coming and we all need to be very focused and figure out how we're going to get ourselves into a good place. And really? that means not being distracted by all sorts of silly things like pronouns and what uh, critical race theory is saying and measuring people's skin color and so on. All of these things are distractions. Mm. And whenever I see, uh, I see too much invested in those sorts of things, it means that companies and individuals are not dealing with what their core purpose is. And that is why I'm very skeptical about so many uh, so many of these things. Cynical optimism, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. I think we will take that. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Kemi Bader.